You're listening to the Music Tech Teacher Podcast, episode number four. Welcome to the Music Tech Teacher Podcast. Music tech tips, lesson ideas, advice, news and interviews, especially for music teachers. Brought to you by midnightmusic.com.au. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Music Tech Teacher Podcast. I'm your host, Katie Wardrobe. I know many of you don't have access to multiple devices, but even if you only have one iPad, that is your own iPad, there are still lots of things that you can do with it with your students in class time. I actually wrote this list quite some time ago and made it into a blog post, so I'll, I'll link to that original blog post in the show notes for this episode. I've actually added an extra thing uh, in today's podcast episode. So the original blog post is 18 ways to use a single iPad in the music classroom. But today I'll actually talk through 19 and I'll try and remember to go back and add the extra one into that original blog post. Now you can find the show notes for this episode at midnightmusic.com.au forward slash four. Most of these ideas require you to plug your iPad into a data projector and speakers so that the students can see the iPad on the large screen and hear it clearly because of course we're using music apps here so they're going to need to hear what's going on. Okay so let's get into the 19 ways you can use a single iPad in the music classroom and the first one that I'm going to talk about is practicing note names. So you can use uh, a number of different apps to drill students on notes of the staff and there are a few ways you can do this with just a single iPad so I thought I'd talk through those. Now the app options that I really like are, now there's a, a number of these but some of my favourites are Staff Wars. There's another one called Flash Note Derby and another one called Noteworks. They're the three that I've used the most, but there are a few options in the, in the iTunes store as well. So in terms of approaches, if you've just got a single iPad, um, of course, you've, with your iPad plugged in, you could get individual students to come up and, um, you know, be the person operating the game. Now, that's okay, but really there's only one student that's getting an interactive um, experience in that case. So it gets a little bit boring for the rest of the class. Uh, you could work in teams where the teams send up a representative as well, and they can take turns to, you know, try and beat each other's scores with different levels in the note name in games. The best way that I think though is that uh, perhaps the teacher actually controls the game itself on the iPad and all of the class gets involved by filling out scorecards as the teacher's playing. So I'll explain how this can work and I'm going to use the example of Star Wars as the app you know to use for this um, but you could probably do it with other apps as well. The reason I'm picking Staff Wars is that I've actually created some scorecards that you can download to do this with your students. And basically, you'll connect your iPad to the data projector and, and open up the app as if you're going to play a game. And the Staff Wars app is a space theme. So basically, when you press the start button, a note flies across the star from the right of the screen towards the left of the screen where the clef is and what you need to do is press a button on the screen which is the letter name of the note and if you press the correct one a spaceship at the bottom of the screen will shoot and it will shoot the note and the note will disappear so the object is to identify the note before it hits the clef and to identify it correctly so if you identify it incorrectly uh, you'll lose a life and if it reaches the cleft before you actually pick a note name it will you'll lose a life in that case as well so if you're the teacher and you're operating the app you can basically have it connected to the data projector open up the app and you're going to be the one to operate the game and and actually identify the notes but you're not going to show the students clearly what you're identifying so as notes appear on the screen you're going to secretly identify the note correctly so that you don't lose a life. And in the meantime, the students can write down their guess at what the note is. So the scorecards that I've designed, um, and this was based on uh, another teacher's idea, so not my original idea, but she, she devised scorecards for her class. And I thought it was such a great idea, I thought I'd make some that everybody could use. And so basically the students will write down their guess and um, you need to identify the note as late as possible to give them an, a decent amount of time to actually guess the note name. So that's a great way to get all the class involved, even if you've just got a single iPad. 
And the little tip that I need to give you is that you do need to secretly make a note of what the notes were as you were identifying them um, so that you can correct the students at the end. So um, you need to just keep a note there. So you'll keep a list of all the notes that you did identify, maybe do 10 and then stop the game and the students can check their answers against yours. The next thing you can do is to practice sight reading rhythm. So in a similar way, you can connect your iPad to the data projector again and start up one of the levels in a rhythmic sight reading app. So for younger students, um, there's one called Rhythm Cat, which might be quite good. And for older students, there's an app called Read Rhythm. Now, I know there are lots of other rhythm apps. So, of course, you know, you, you use the one that you feel is best and perhaps one you've had experience with. But again, one person will need to be the person to tap the rhythm on the iPad screen as if they're playing the game on their own. But in fact, it will show on the data projector. But the way to get the students involved with this rather than everybody just watching one person play the game is that the students can, of course, play or clap the rhythm along with um, the, the one that's actually playing the game. So they could use body percussion or classroom instruments. Um, they could even use melodic instruments and you could pick a note or a couple of notes that work well together and they can play them in the rhythm that's showing on the screen. The third option for using your single iPad is to use it as a metronome, uh, but sort of an, a metronome with an interesting rhythm rather than just a boring TikTok type metronome. So what I've done in the past is to open up the GarageBand app, and most people have the GarageBand app because it comes included with um, iPads that are uh, uh, purchased recently, and you can easily download it. It's well worth the investment if you if you do have to buy it because you've got an older iPad. Um, there's so much you can do with just this one single app, so definitely worth downloading. So what I have done in the past is to open up what's called the Smart Drums in GarageBand, and the Smart Drums allow you to generate a, a rhythm really, really fast, and it sounds really good. Basically, the Smart Drums is a grid, and you choose a particular drum kit, a drum kit type. So that might be um, a drum machine type, or it might actually be like a, a, a classic rock kit. And with, depending on which one you choose, you'll have a selection of sounds down the right hand side of the screen. And you can drag those sounds onto the grid and it will generate a sort of a pre-made rhythm based on what you drag into the grid and where you place the sounds in the grid. So you can make something quite busy or something quite sparse and you've got quite a few options there of sounds. You don't have to include all of the sounds that you've been given on the right hand side but you can just have a few. Now if you're feeling lazy there's a little dice picture at the bottom left hand side of the screen and you can just tap that and GarageBand will literally generate the rhythm for you so that's an even quicker way to do it. Now once you've got the drum pattern going of course you can use this to accompany the class and they might be playing an ensemble arrangement or even doing scales. So if you're doing um, you know, band, orchestra, choir rehearsals and you're doing scales or warm-ups, you could have a drum pattern going from the GarageBand smart drums just to make it a little bit more interesting. You've got complete control over the tempo in the app because you can go into the settings menu and make the tempo very slow or quite fast or you could increase the tempo over time as the students are getting um, better practiced with their scales. If you don't want to use uh, GarageBand, of course, there's lots of other options. I've got a fantastic app called Drum Jam and also another one which I really love called DM1. That's D for dog, M for Mary, and then the number one. That's the name of the app. And both of those are specifically drum apps and they, they make excellent rhythms, really good variety, lots of world rhythm styles and, and all sorts of things. So definitely give that a go. In keeping with that idea, you could also uh, create a class backing track and play along with classroom instruments or your band, orchestra, choir, ensemble. So you can easily create a backing track again in GarageBand by choosing one or two of the smart instruments there, which allow you to generate a um, melodic style backing really fast. So there's a um, smart keyboard, there's a smart guitar, and there is um, the third one I've forgotten. The smart drums, of course, but we've talked about that one. There's also a smart bass guitar, that's the last one. And the smart keyboard or guitar particularly are great um, options. Oh, the smart strings, that's the one, smart strings. Uh, you can 
open those up and you're presented with cord strips. Now, if you're like me um, and you grew up, you know, a few decades ago, so in the 70s and 80s, uh, my mum was actually a music teacher and she had one of those auto harps where you'd press a letter name being a chord and strum the strings of the auto harp to hear a chord play. Now, when I look at the smart instruments in Garage Band, that's what I'm reminded of. So it's a little bit like that. So, for instance, you might open up the smart guitar and you'll see the chords across the screen there and you can play the chords by just tapping on one of the strips and you'll hear the guitar strumming sound. If you've got the strings open, you'll hear a, a string pizzicato sound, an ensemble sound, and the keyboard, you'll hear the keyboard play a chord, whichever strip you tap on. So it's really fast to um, set up a quick song. So you can set your number of bars, you can choose your tempo, and then you can press record and just record a really fast backing track. So something like a 12 bar blues backing, or one of those pop songs that just has three or four chords, you could create a quick backing by um, using the smart guitar or strings. Now the way they create um, a quick backing for you is that they have an autoplay pattern button or dial. So basically if you turn the dial of the smart guitar to pattern number one, it will give you a strumming pattern of some sort. If you turn it to option number two, you'll get maybe a picking pattern in that guitar and number three and number four will give you different options again. And each of the smart instruments has this autoplay pattern. So once you press record and then play your chords in time, it will generate a strumming pattern as you go. And very little work, you get a really effective backing track quite quickly. Once you've created your backing track, the students can then play along or sing along or with, with whatever piece it is that you're doing. Teaching the parts of the drum kit uh, can be really useful as well. And again, I'm going to use Garage Fantasy example. You can open up uh, one of the other drum options in Garage Band. So not the smart drums this time, but uh, what I call <laughs> in inverted commas, the real drums. And you can see when you open up these real drums, you can actually see a drum kit picture on the screen. So you get to see all the parts of the drum kit, the, the kick drum and the snare and all the cymbals and so on. And you can play individually each of those sounds by tapping your finger on different parts of the screen. Now, I love seeing this drum kit opened up on the data projector. It looks really good. It's really clear and easy to see all the parts of the kit. So if you're doing, you know, a, a unit of work with your year sevens, for example, on the drum kit, it's fantastic to be able to show the students what the drum kit's like and actually label all the different parts and get them to know what they each sound like. Now of course it's going to be best if you've got a real live drum kit in the classroom but often when you want to run that lesson maybe the drum teacher's in that day and they're using the drum kit at that time so this gives you a great backup option. You can tie this in with uh, the students learning a basic rock pattern, say using body percussion, and then get them to replicate it on the iPad screen. So again, you could get students to take turns at this while the rest of the class is playing along with their own body percussion um, version of the drum pattern. And it's just a great way to get to know the parts of the kit and how the rock pattern works. As a little extension activity or side activity to that teaching the parts of the drum kit. Uh, you could also teach students how drum patterns are put together from an arranging point of view or composing point of view. So I like the DM1 step sequencer drum machine that I mentioned earlier, that app that I mentioned earlier. And it's a step sequencer, so it has a series of dots across the screen for each of the parts of the kit. So if you look down the left-hand side, you'll see a list of the different um, parts of the kit listed. So there'll be a, the kick drum, and then underneath that, the hi-hat and the snare drum and each of the cymbals and so on. Now acrossways, there's a series of dots which make up uh, basically one bar of music and if you turn the dots on that's going to be the place in the bar where the kick drum plays and if, if it's a, a dot that's turned off it will not play at that time. So you can easily talk through things like placing the kick drum on the first and third beat of the bar and then placing the snare drum in the gap so on the second and fourth beat and students are able to see how that works and see it quite visually so it's kind of in my mind like a visual notation version of a drum grid and you could then even take it further and get them to do sort of standard or traditional notation version of that as well. 
It's great for visually seeing how different stylistic drum patterns look visually. And so you could set up the basic rock pattern as a starting point if you've been doing that. And then maybe change things a little bit, vary the pattern that you've got showing on the screen so that they can see how an R&B pattern looks and what maybe um, a jazz or blues shuffle looks like, which can be quite different. Moving on from drum parts, you can also use your iPad to show a large on-screen keyboard instead. So rather than, you know, having to draw on the whiteboard a picture of a, a keyboard, you can actually show it within your one of your iPad apps. So again, GarageBand, of course, has a lot of keyboard options in there. So you might want to choose one of those. And there's lots of different looking ones, depending on which type of synthesizer or piano you choose. Um, another one that can be quite useful is called Virtuoso Piano. And that one has letter names on each of the notes. So I know some of you particularly working with younger students are keen to have a keyboard which shows the names, uh, letter names on each note. That's the only one I've found that does that so far. I'd love to know if you have come across another app that does that as well, a keyboard app that shows the letter names on each note. But that's the one I've found so far. Now that's a free app and um, the, the only thing I'll, I'll say is that it does have adverts in the app. You need to just make sure if you're working with really young students, just make sure the adverts are suitable for them to be seeing if you're displaying your iPad on the big screen. Um, occasionally I've seen adverts in there which I think are uh, maybe not quite so suitable for young students. So do check that out ahead of time before you have it in front of your class. So getting on to more of a performance side of things, uh, something that you can do with your iPad is to use uh, possibly my favourite music app other than GarageBand, which is Loopy HD. Now this is a looping, live looping app, and it's been featured a number of times on the Jimmy Fallon uh, Tonight Show. And he first used it, I think, with Billy Joel there, and they did a, a version of The Lion Sleeps Tonight. And he's since used it with a number of guests, and there's lots of videos you can look at on YouTube where they're using this app. Essentially, um, the app shows you some circles on the screen and each one of those can be a separate musical part. So you get the first one going and you can do something like sing a little ostinato and then on top of that, on another circle, you can create another part. So basically you can tap the next circle and layer on a second part that goes with the first one you've already recorded. The first one keeps playing while you're recording for the second one. And then you can go on to the third circle and the fourth circle and you can build up an arrangement. It's a fantastic thing to do. Really, really useful. Uh, sometimes it can be good to do this uh, with a group. So you can lay down, if you, as the teacher, you might lay down the first track and that might be perhaps a rhythmic thing or maybe it's a bass line. And then if you've just got the one single iPad, you can get students to come up and while your original track is playing, they can one by one sing and record into one of the other circles to add to that piece that you're creating. So the students, in essence, will help you build up the layers. Once you've got a backing going, you can actually get everybody to sing across the top of it. So you can treat it like a backing track and get everybody to sing along. The Line Sleeps Tonight is a great piece to start with because pretty much everybody knows that or they've, they've heard it at least in the past and um, have, you know, a bit familiar with it. So if you want to give it a go, that, that's often the one I use in workshops to demonstrate it. Uh, but there's lots of other songs that lend themselves to this as well. Now the next thing as an extension to that one is to do the same sort of thing. You could set up some sort of backing track and then actually get students while the backing track's going that you've set up in Loopy, you get the students to perhaps improvise over the top. So you could set up say a blues style backing and then get them to sing or play their instrument and layer that or, or record that or even just perform it. They don't even need to record it. They can just play and improvise over the top of that backing. So that, that can be a great thing. I've done this with young students where I've set up a basic rhythm on the first track and then get them to come up and press the second one and improvise just off the top of their head, make up a rhythm that goes with the first one or, or is in a contrast even to the first one. And you can keep building up like that. It's great for um, encouraging students to in, improvise and experiment with things like um, beatboxing and, you know, body percussion and that sort of thing. You could record their body percussion rhythms. It doesn't have to be out of their voice. And you could even have them playing instruments to do that too. 
Another great thing I've had success with, and I've, I've actually really only tried this with teachers so far in workshops, but it works really well and um, they seem to love it and have reported back that it's worked well with their students. And this is to do with pitch matching. So this is a great one for younger students. There is an app called Singing Fingers. And again, you can plug your iPad into the data projector so students can see this. And Singing Fingers is a drawing app, but it's got a little bit of a difference. You can only draw on the screen if you're making a sound. So if you run your fingers along the screen and you're not making a sound, nothing will happen. Nothing appears on the white blank screen that, that is there when you open up the Singing Fingers app. However, if you make a noise while you're dragging your finger along the screen, you'll get some colour and a line will appear. It's, it's really good. It's quite vibrant. So it looks really good when you show it on the data projector. So what I've done in the past is to sing a single note while I draw a line on the screen. And when you do that, Singing Fingers actually matches different pitches to different colours. So often I pick, I'm, I think I must pick the same note because I often get a, a note which is sort of a pinky purpley colour. So I will drag my finger along the screen and um, so while I'm singing a note and this pink line will appear and it looks great. So then I get the teachers in my workshop to sing the same note while I draw my finger across the screen again. And what you can do is get, when they sing their note, you can then compare the color of their line to the color of your original line and see if they match. Because singing fingers will always match the same pitch to the same color. So if their note is not the same, the color will not appear the same on the screen. Now, when I do this with teachers, I actually get them to deliberately do the wrong note first. So, so I sing my note and draw the line. And then I say, okay, everybody, you, you're gonna sing a note, but just pick any note, any note. And they're all, it's, it sounds awful but I draw my line. And when we do that, um, the, the line is not even a single color. It's all this multicolor. It looks really messy and murky. And then I get them to sing the correct note the second time through. So I draw another line underneath and with everybody singing the correct note, we can see easily that the colors do match the first line and their last effort, um, the colors actually do match. So that's a great way to visual, visually connect pitch and you know whether the pitch is the same or not. Lots of other things you can do with singing fingers, which I might talk about in a future episode, but that's one really simple thing. So that's the first 10 ideas for a single iPad done. After the break, we'll continue on with the remaining nine ideas and look at how to use your iPad as a listening station. We'll look at some apps for discovering the orchestra and how you can use your iPad as a TV camera. This episode of the Music Tech Teacher podcast is brought to you by the Midnight Music Community. The Midnight Music Community is an online space for music teachers who'd like help using technology in their music lessons. There are online courses, video tutorials, lesson plans, music tech news, and professional development certificates are provided for any training that you undertake. I'm inside the community every day, personally answering members' questions and sharing tips and ideas. The best thing is that you get to connect with hundreds of other music teachers just like you and share your own experiences and occasional music tech frustrations. For more information and a special joining price just for the listeners of this podcast, visit midnightmusic.com.au forward slash podcast offer. That's midnightmusic.com.au forward slash podcast offer. Another GarageBand one here, you can teach form using GarageBand. And if you've been talking about form, so, you know, talking about, say, ternary form, section A, returning, going to section B, and then returning back to section A again, or some other form, you can actually use GarageBand to kind of illustrate that. So what I've done in the past is to create a really simple chord sequence and record that and that becomes my section A. So let's say I recorded eight bars of a chord sequence. Then you can go into GarageBand's song sections menu and you can actually duplicate that section that you've created. So if I've got my first eight bars recorded, I can go into the song sections menu and hit duplicate and it will give me a whole copy of that eight bars right next to the first lot of eight bars. And then you can duplicate it a second time. So you end, 
In my example here, you can end up with three sections which are identical. So I've got section A, section A and section A. Then what I can do is go in with the students, go into section B and we can actually make some adjustments. So here is where you can talk to the students about, you know, in, in form, if you want uh, to have something different, you'll need to make some adjustments to that middle section. So whatever you've recorded and copied into that middle section, you can maybe take some instruments out or vary the chord sequence and re-record sections so that section B is quite different. And then, of course, you've already got section A, which is at the end. Now, that means that you can easily see and hear now the difference between the A, the B and the A section again. So students can listen and identify, perhaps identify the three sections as you get to them. Now, the only issue I have with this in GarageBand, and it makes me a bit sad because I think it would be such an easy thing for them to change or fix, is that the song sections uh, you have not in the past, and maybe you will in the future, but you haven't been able to rename them. So when you do duplicate that first one three times, so you've got, well, three times of it uh, in a row, GarageBand will automatically call it A and then B, and the last one's going to be called C, unfortunately. So I think it's a little bit sad because I would love it if you could just rename it A so that it's really clear for the students what you're talking about because, of course, you're teaching them that the return of that original section is A again and not C. But, you know, you need to toss up whether that's going to work with the age of students that you're working with. Another quick thing you can do in GarageBand app is to open up one of the keyboards, particularly the synthesizer instruments. And you can talk about sound synthesis by using one of these instruments. So a number of the synthesizers within GarageBand have some knobs that you can adjust. And as a group, you could adjust them and talk about the difference in sound as you're making the changes. So you can adjust things like the attack and the cutoff and the delay and the release and so on. And then you could talk with the students about how does that change the sound? So if you've changed the attack or the cutoff or the delay, how is the sound different from the original version that you've just had? So is it harsh or is it mellow or smooth or bright or soft? So that could be a way to tie in your discussions about tone colour and timbre and that sort of thing by using that synthesizer instrument in GarageBand. Now, one of the um, popular things that people want to do when they first get an iPad, and one of the, it's really one of the reasons that many music teachers get an iPad in the first place, is to use the iPad as a score reading device so that you've got a digital version of your score and you can use it as a, a score reading device where you can do quick page turns and navigate through the score really easily. And you can even hold multiple copies of scores on your iPad without having to cart around a box of paper scores instead. So the app that I like for this, and, and I'll talk about using it you know, with one iPad with your students, uh, I use the Fourscore app and this is an app, it, it's basically a way that you can op open up PDFs of music scores and read them really quickly and easily within the app. The thing I like, uh, well, one of the basic things that this does really well is the page turns are so super fast. So if you have a class ensemble um, and you want to display your score on the screen, you could do it inside the Fourscore app. And it means that you as the, the director, you can actually show the digital version on the screen using Fourscore and do really fast page turns much quicker than you could ever well, all the students could ever physically turn paper pages as they're playing. So that can be a great way if you want to have a central um, location for your score and, and all eyes up to the front of the classroom instead of everybody looking heads down on paper score on the floor, for instance, or on a music stand. Now, one of the ninja tips that I'm going to suggest is that you set up links in your score if there are repeats in the music. So Fourscore allows you to set up repeats where there is a first and second time bar, for instance, and a coda. You can set up links from one page to the next. So, for instance, if you're playing through the score and you get to the first time bar, you play through the first time bar, at the end of the first time bar, you can set up a little link so that when you tap at that bar at the end of the first time bar, it will actually spring back to page one or whichever page it is you need to go back to, to do the second time through of that, um, that music. 
it makes it really fast and it, it saves that whole fumbling around with pages and thinking where where do we go back to. Um, great for coders particularly. That's the place where people usually get a bit lost with page turns. So you can set up links in the score. So have a go maybe at using that on the data projector with your students rather than just projecting up a, a plain old PDF copy, which you could also do, but this would make it a little bit more easy to read. Now the next one I've got is uh, interactive listening. Now there's a great free interactive listening app called Explorium Sound Uncovered and it's a free app. It's kind of a bit like an interactive book and the app has some facts about sound just generally and there's pictures and there's audio de demonstrations and activities that you can do. So it's lots of fun, it's really interesting and so if you're doing a unit just generally like the science of sound, this would be a great one to offer some extra, you know, activities or materials that you can do with uh, students. Now, you could again display this on the, um, the data projector so that the whole class can look together as a group. Or this might be something that you have, you know, as a separate little station. So while the class are doing other activities, maybe there's one small group of students doing this as an independent activity where they're going through one section or a couple of sections of this app and looking at the audio demonstrations and doing some of the activities there. In a similar way, you can use your app as a listening post. So the next suggestion is to use uh, your, not your app, your iPad as a listening post. So you could have your iPad set up in a corner of the classroom and this could be a place where individual students go to do some listening to a piece of music or maybe even small groups of students go and, and use your one single iPad to listen to something there. They may um, maybe have a worksheet that is there as well and they're, they're going to answer some questions so they can work quite independently. Now if you have a Belkin Rockstar headphone adapter. This is a little adapter that allows you to have up to five students listening with headphones to a single iPad. So you plug the little adapter in and it's got a place where you can plug in five uh, different sets of headphones. So this is fantastic in the classroom, if you, particularly if you've just got one iPad or a minimal number of iPads. You can actually have five students all listening with headphones at once to the one thing. Now the next thing I'm going to suggest as a group activity is to use your iPad as a sound effects board for a storytelling project. So there's a number of ways you could do this but uh, one app that I love for this purpose is called MadPad and MadPad is a sound board app which allows you to record 12 separate sounds in different squares. Now when you record your sound in MadPad, you actually record video at the same time. So it's, it's visual as well as, um, you know, involving sound. So 12 separate sounds. So you could do something like, as a group, work out uh, a collection of sound effects that you're going to record as your class set of sound effects. So 12 sound effects. And then students could perhaps go away and work in groups together to write a story that incorporates as many of those sound effects as possible. Once they've written their story, they can practice it and perform it and then come up one by one and use your iPad to actually perform the sound effects that you've recorded in MadPad. So one by one, the groups can come up and perhaps one person is a narrator and someone else is also saying part of the story. And then there might be one of the students in the group who's operating the iPad, which has the sound effects that you've recorded in the MadPad app. That one's lots of fun. If you do have access to more than one iPad, a group of iPads or a class set, that's a great activity to do with the entire class all at once. They can each create their own set of sound effects in MadPad. Lots of fun. Heading into the last few here, I've got three more suggestions for a single iPad. Um, the next one is uh, Discovering the Orchestra and there's a fantastic number of apps that can teach students about the instruments of the orchestra or well-known classical pieces of music and along the way they'll learn about that piece of music and the composer and also about instruments of the orchestra as well. So by displaying the iPad on the data projector, you can look at everything as a group together and you're able to see instrument images and videos and sound ranges and example pieces and look at the talk about the role of the conductor and so on. 
Apps that I really love for this, are, um, there's one called The Orchestra and that one's a really fantastic app. It takes up a little bit of room on your iPad, so just make sure you've got enough space. It's well worth it. It's, it's a super high quality app, looks fabulous and you can basically um, see different players of the orchestra playing the instruments. They'll actually demonstrate what they sound like. You can see the range of each instrument. You can hear some well-known pieces being played. You can see video footage of the orchestra performing that piece. You can see the conductor. There's a um, little section where you can click through and see a, a specific instrument, say the bassoon. And you can actually look at the bassoon picture and rotate it on the app. So you can see the bassoon from all sides. And there's the same for all of the instruments in the orchestra. So it's great if you've perhaps not got access to a real version of an instrument, a real live bassoon or a real live, you know, whatever it is, set of um, timpani that day. Uh, you can bring them up on the screen and show the students what they look like from all sides. You can hear them and you can see players talking about them as well. So that's a great app. There's some other apps which are great as well. Um, the Melbourne Symphony Orchestra, which is, you know, from where I am, they have a free app called MSO Learn. And that one does similar things to that, that um, you know, that first app that I mentioned. Uh, not as many features and as many things in there, but it's still a great starting place. And if you need a free version, that, that's a good one to go for. There's a fantastic Carnival of the Animals app and I will link to all of these apps in the show notes. So if you want to look these specific ones up, uh, you can head over there and just click on the link and it will take you to the iTunes uh, place. But uh, the Carnival of the Animons, uh, Animals one is also beautiful. Uh, for young students, Naxos has a, an app called My First Classical Music app. And the, the one that I've shown quite a bit in workshops, uh, is a, a, there's a free one, which is the Young Person's Guide to the Orchestra, and that one's also well worth a look. Last couple of things I'll mention, and these are kind of obvious basic things, but sometimes I find if I mention them in workshops, people haven't uh, clicked that they could do this with their iPad. Uh, the second last thing I'm going to talk about is the fact that you can just simply use your iPad to capture student performances. So just open up that camera app, hit the video record button and, you know, record students playing and singing. It's a really great way, you know, you may want to keep it and archive the performances if it's a proper performance, but if it's just in classroom, class time, it's a great way for students to get instant feedback about their playing. And even things like if you're a studio music teacher or an ensemble leader, Videoing your students might help them to realise that maybe they're not holding their instrument quite correctly. Maybe they think they are and, and actually when they see themselves on video, they're not quite holding it correctly and you can sort of show that to them. Video is also great for assessment purposes. So um, students can, you know, ma maybe use your single iPad in the corner of the room to record themselves doing something that you're going to then assess at a later time. Sometimes it can be hard to listen or watch every student in class if you need to assess them. So having your iPad set up somewhere where students can just make a recording and then you can go back to that later, that can be quite helpful. And the very last thing I'm going to share is using your iPad as what I'm calling a TV camera. <laughs> it's not quite really, but uh, basically if you set your iPad up somehow on a, a stand, and there are various clips that you can purchase to clip your iPad to say a music stand. You could have, again, open up the camera app, but this time you can have the camera pointing at you playing the instrument that you're demonstrating to your students. So if you've got a class of 24 students and you're doing a ukulele unit, for instance, it can be difficult for the kids at the back of the room to maybe see, you know, the exact position of your fingers on the fretboard to make the chord that they need to make. So if you set up your iPad and it's connected to the data projector, once you open up the camera app, if it's pointing at your hand, it's going to show really big on the screen, just like you're on TV. And that can really help some students just to see a bit more clearly the thing that you want to show them. So it doesn't have to be guitar or ukulele. It might even be recorder fingering. Um, you might be demonstrating something. Um, you know, I, I used to play double reed instruments and uh, on my teaching rounds before the iPad was in existence, I actually showed you know, the reeds that you use to play the bassoon and the oboe. And, you know, if kids haven't seen that, that can be really interesting. So to be able to show them through the camera app and to see it large on the screen, 
that can help, you know, rather than having everyone crowd around and not be able to see, that can help you see, it, all the students see, see quite clearly there. So I really hope you found some of these suggestions useful. I'm, I'm hoping that you'll actually give some of them a go. I'd love to hear from you if you actually do give them a go. You can tweet me on Twitter and my Twitter name is at Katie SW1, S for Sam, W for wardrobe, number one. And you can also connect with me on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash midnight music. The Music Tech Teacher podcast is hosted by me, Katie Wardrobe. You can find more information and the links from today's episode at midnightmusic.com.au forward slash four. Thanks for listening and I'll see you next time.